Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Tech Talk series. We are going to be talking about what trans and queer people know about the internet. I'm Amin from Coquitlam Public Library, and my colleague Shirley is here as well. And we have uh, Kate, who is joined with us, who is joining with us from uh, SFU, who is an assistant professor, and we have SFU Library here as well. And Kate, I'll uh, let you get started. Okay. Thank you. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for being here. I'm just going to um, share my screen. How's that look? Great. Okay. Um, so let me just finish getting set up. Um, so thank you, um, Shirley and uh, Iman at Coquitlam Public Library and also um, Arian Vinning at uh, SFU Libraries for um, organizing this event. I'm uh, really happy to be here talking with you all. Um, and thanks uh, for, for coming out this evening. Um, I'm actually in Ontario right now visiting my parents, which is why it looks like I'm sitting in a sauna. I'm not sitting in a sauna, I assure you. I am in, uh, they live in a rural area in like a cabin kind of thing. So that is the, the vibe is a lot of wood paneling. Um, and it's fitting because I'm going to be starting off the talk talking a little bit about being a queer um, teenager on the early internet, which is maybe something we can all uh, relate to. So the purpose of tonight's talk is, is a workshop format. So I'm going to test out some ideas. I'm going to bring together some different ideas from my research and my teaching. And I hope that if you would all like to, you, would like, you may wish to share um, your ideas or thoughts about either the history of the internet for trans and queer people or um, what you think it means uh, today for trans and queer people and what some of the, the challenges are that, that we face around online communication. Um, I am a media historian for the most part. So I look at the ways that uh, trans and queer people have used the internet in the past. I look at what the internet meant to trans and queer communities when it was new. And I focus a lot on the work that different kinds of activists have used with internet technologies. So I have a, a book that came out last year um, called Information Activism, A Queer History of Lesbian Media Technologies. That's a history of the internet written through um, lesbian feminism. I've also done a lot of work on uh, the way that AIDS activists in the 1980s and 90s took up internet technologies. Uh, but I also research and teach about what the internet means and how it is used by trans and queer people in the present. And I'm going to try and bring um, that history together um, with these kinds of present day concerns in, in the talk and the workshop I'm going to offer today. So I think we're pretty used to at this point thinking of the internet as a, a space of uh, corporate control, right? We're, we're used to thinking of the internet as driven by algorithms that are biased, that serve commerce, that are biased because they're built and trained badly. Um, we think of social media often as a space of toxicity. Uh, and the internet, right, is often considered to be a dangerous space or a space that can't be trusted. So these are stories we're used to hearing. And as a queer and a non-binary trans person and also a scholar of digital media, these are stories about the internet that I agree with. I know these things to be true about the internet, um, but they're not entirely true. So I think a lot in my work about the ways that queer and trans people have long found methods to carve out alternative systems and spaces of communication and information sharing ways of using the internet differently that place their communities at the center. And so what I'm going to do today is share with you some things that I think trans and queer people know about the internet. These strategies and tactics of use and also examples of speaking back to designs and infrastructures that and systems that are harmful. And I'm going to do this today because I think that these examples can show everyone um, other ways of imagining and relating to not just the internet that we have right now, but also the internet that we want to build, that we want to have in the future. So as I'm talking today, I'm going to invite you all to um, take part in the chat as much as you want to in any way you want to. So if you have a question that comes up along the way, feel free to ask it. If something I say reminds you of a personal experience or something that you've read, feel free to share that or share links in the chat. And I hope that can become a kind of space where the workshop can um, come a little bit more 
alive today. So I'm going to start um, with a personal story um, because I've been thinking a lot lately about uh, what our first memories are of, of using the internet. And I did an um, uh, uh, interview a few months ago uh, with Rhea McNamara, uh, who's a journalist, and uh, Mindy Sue, who's a, uh, also a scholar of um, feminist internet uh, stuff and the author of the uh, Cyber Feminist Index, which is a really neat online archive of early feminist internet online texts, mostly from the 90s. And at the beginning of the interview, uh, Rhea asked us to share our first memories of, of going online and what it meant to us. And um, I thought that was a really interesting way to start off um, the interview because it made me think in a really kind of personal way about how the ways we come to online spaces are driven by um, our kind of needs to connect often with others or, or find community, especially in a queer and trans context. So uh, Rhea asked that question and I said back, um, I was born in 1983 and I grew up middle class. We didn't have a computer at, my, at home, but my dad worked from home and he had a work computer and I was allowed to use it in the evening or on the weekends. My first experience going online uh, was getting an America Online CD. This used to be sent out in the mail. Maybe some other folks who are here remember that. I put it in the computer CD drive um, and there was nothing on America Online that interested me. But I would have been like maybe 11 or 13 at that time. And then from there at a friend's house, friends showed me um, the World Wide Web. And I got really into a platform called GeoCities, which was a platform you could use to make your own kind of simple home pages. And this was at uh, a point in my life where it was like puberty time. So I was figuring out that I was queer and GeoCities was this world where I could access information about what it meant to be queer and what it meant to be um, a gay kid. Um, and if there's anyone in the in the room who was into GeoCities or had a GeoCities site, I'd love to hear from you um, in the chat about that. But as I mentioned, GeoCities were these kinds of simple home pages you could make. People often made them um, about themselves. And they weren't just spaces for representation and information sharing for queer and trans youth, right? They were used by queer and trans people of all ages. And, and this is an example of uh, one of those GeoCities home pages made by an older person. So this is a site uh, called the Retired Old Queens GeoCities homepage. This is circa the late 1990s. I found this record um, by the um, internet archive of this uh, person's site that they made to reach out to other, as they describe it, LGBT friends on the internet. So we can think here, right, of the ways that the World Wide Web from the very beginning was this kind of space of encounter, of reaching out and of world building for queer folks. And I think a lot about this moment um, when the internet is new and what it means to trans and queer people um, in my work and in the research I do. So um, a project that I think is really great that I have drawn on in my own research and that I really admire is the Queer Digital History Project, which is a project put together by Dr. Avery Dame Griff. And this is an online archive that Dr. Dame Griff has put together of records related to queer and trans internet use um, in the 1980s, but primarily the 1990s. So Dr. Dame Griff has gathered together all of these kinds of archives and collections of um, listservs, um, uh, Usenet or discussion boards. Um, and they're here for people to now to take a look at and to think about how queer and trans people were using the internet in the 1980s and 90s. And I have the link up there if anyone's interested in it. This is one of the projects or listservs that Dr. Dame Griff has archived on this site. Um, is, it's called TGNet. This was an independent or describes itself as an independent transgender computer network for sharing information and sending messages. It was popular in the early 1990s. And Dr. Dame Griff has mapped out um, the kind of connections um, on TGNet. So these were the kind of main um, like servers or hubs that connected this network together. And so you can think right about each of these uh, little computers with a cord hooked up to it on this map, connecting transgender folks across North America with each other. And 
people would be drawn to this network for lots of reasons. Um, but a really important reason would be to share information about access to healthcare, right? So access to um, healthcare like uh, gender confirming surgery, for example, or hormones, um, or advice about um, personal issues, uh, just meeting other people who are similar to you, knowing what their lives are like. These are the kind of things that folks might reach out to others about. Um, and we can think about how, you know, particularly for someone who might not be out in their offline life, this kind of online experience in the 1990s as a trans person might be really, um, really important. Um, this is a third example I'll share that's related to AIDS activism, also in the 1990s. This is an activist I really admire named Kiyoshi Kuramiya, who I've studied um, quite a lot. He was a, a Japanese American um, AIDS activist and he ran a popular online network and website for people living with HIV. It was called Critical Path. And on this site, um, he shared all kinds of um, up to date information about um, HIV that was coming out, especially, especially about treatment and healthcare. And he also published his website in print form um, as a newsletter so that people who didn't have internet access could also access this information. And he was doing this work because it was really hard to find good, accurate, up-to-date information about HIV during this time period. That information was often uh, censored because of stigma. And so he really thought about the internet as this kind of unique and new space where queer folks um, and all kinds of sexual minorities could um, circulate information that was meaningful to them um, and reach each other in ways that would be kind of more free of, um, of censorship. And I really love this picture of him um, sitting at his two computers kind of doing the behind the scenes uh, maintenance work that's involved in this kind of um, online outreach during this time period. So there's two main takeaways I want us to, to think about um, when uh, we're thinking about LGBTQ plus web history. So the first point I want to make is that trans and queer people were really significant early adopters of the internet. We hear this term early adopters um, often when we think about or read uh, media coverage of um, new digital technologies, right? So early adopters is a term for like people who get Apple watches when they first come out. Um, but we can also think about early adopters, not just as like tech savvy people, but as folks who are driven by a need to provide their communities with information and connection that's not otherwise being um, fulfilled. And the second takeaway is that um, Queer and trans folks have used online communication to fulfill specific individual and community needs from the very beginning of the commercial internet. And so some of the specific needs we've looked at so far are uh, the need for trans communities to share information about um, healthcare, for example, um, and the need for people living with HIV to share information about healthcare as well. And also the GeoCities context of people just wanting to connect, to see representations of people like them and to give an account of themselves in the world for other people to read. Um, and so I'll, I'm gonna leave this section of the talk now and what I wanna leave it with is a question to you all, um, which is what is your first memory of using the internet? And it may be that your first memory of the internet comes much later in life than it does for me, right? Or for a very different reason. But I'd like us all to think about that and reflect on it. Um, and if you would like to, I invite you to share it in the chat. So that's a little introduction to uh, the workshop. Um, and I'm gonna move now from the past into the present. Um, I'm going to focus on three different takeaways or points that I want to make today. These are three things that I think or that I'm going to argue that trans and queer people know about the internet that the world more generally can learn from. So the first thing I'll talk about is trans and queer people know how to design inclusive databases. And I'm going to talk about what that means and also why that matters. 
Trans and queer people know why we should fight online censorship, why that matters and how we can do it. And three, trans and queer people know how we can imagine digital utopias. And that comes back to that piece I mentioned earlier of like, how do we kind of get out of this dumpster fire of the internet as it is today and try to imagine and build um, something else. So I'll start with how to design inclusive databases. Um, so I'm going to talk about this a little bit through um, uh, experience I had um, during the COVID-19 related move to um, online work and online learning that many of us uh, have gone through in the last um, year and a half. So at SFU where I teach, we very quickly moved from teaching on in classrooms to teaching on uh, Zoom, which is the, the very same platform that we are on um, right now. And when SFU first transitioned to Zoom, um, nobody was really sure how to use it. We weren't really sure what the social contract was on Zoom, how to interact with each other. And we kind of figured it out as we went along and figured it out um, in an astonishingly quick way in retrospect. So as I made this shift to online teaching with my students in the classroom, I noticed a problem right away. And the problem that I noticed is when you were using your SFU Zoom account, so the account provided to you as a staff member, or a student by the university, your display name or the name that shows underneath your photo uh, was not changeable. You couldn't edit it. And the name was drawn from either your student record or your employee record. So the display name that showed on Zoom whenever you logged in was drawn from one of two databases. If you're a student, it was drawn from a student records database. If you're an employee, it was drawn from an employee database. So my name in SFU's employee data database is Caitlin McKinney, which is not a name um, that I use. I use the name Kate, um, but that is the name on my birth certificate. And you can imagine that this is a huge problem for lots of folks whose name on their legal documents is not the name that they use in real life. So uh, transgender people for sure are a category um, right away that affected students in my class because I teach a lot of courses that appeal to trans and, and queer students. Um, many of my East Asian students also used names, preferred names in the classroom that weren't um, their legal names and wanted to be able to display their preferred names on their, um, on their Zoom. So the other problem is that you couldn't um, display your pronouns. And so this was leading to folks being kind of more routinely misgendered in the online classroom space. So lots of folks at SFU reached out to the IT about this and explained how it was affecting people and why it mattered. And it took a while, but IT services eventually changed the settings on SFU Zoom accounts so that SFU users could alter their display name in Zoom. Um, and it's great that they made that change and I'm really glad that they did. But there's a couple of problems here I wanna point out about online technologies and digital technologies. So first, the original database is inflexible. So these student records databases and these employee um, records databases, they only record your legal name and they prioritize that data about your legal name over other data that these databases might collect such as your preferred name. So these databases could be designed in another way. They could prioritize data that uh, we as users want prioritized, how we want ourselves to be seen and represented in public. Second problem I wanna point out is that no one involved in making these high level decisions about how Zoom would work at the university was thinking about the needs of transgender people. These needs and the existence of trans people had not occurred to them. Right? So this is a problem of who is invited to participate as a designer when we think about digital platforms and environments. And the burden is placed on trans people to do the work of advocating for basic dignity in the ways that they're represented in online environments. And this, the stakes of this were very real, right? Like this is for, for me um, as a teacher, it was really difficult to see how much this was harming some of my trans students. Um, and so the change was made and that's wonderful, but we need to ask uh, from the very beginning how we can make better choices and um, design databases in more inclusive ways. 
And this is not a problem that is unique to Zoom or, or new. So this is an older example from um, 2015 of uh, Facebook. And uh, the moment when Facebook added new gender options for users it caused a lot of um, media attention and perhaps uh, many of you took advantage of changing your, um, your gender on your Facebook profile when this, this change was offered to users. So we can think right about drop down menus for choosing our gender and how they pop up all of the time in our lives. And often I'm asked to choose uh, a gender from a drop down menu um, in moments where like they do not need that information. And so you kind of wonder like, well, who was at the meeting where the decision was made to create a database with a category for gender? And how did they choose what the different data points would be that users could choose from? Um, these decisions matter, right? They have significant effects on how we interact with um, online environments. So Facebook in 2015 creates all these different um, display name options. Uh, it, the number and type of options varied from country to country, but in general, it was kind of like, I think between like 30 and the mid fifties in terms of options that you had available to you. Um, but as uh, a couple of different scholars have pointed out, and uh, in particular, um, Carleton University professor Rena Bibbins has done a bunch of work on this. Even though Facebook users had all of these options for changing the gender that was displayed on their profile, in the background, Facebook's database is still recording their gender as being either male, female, or nothing. So they were recorded as either male, female, or nothing. And Facebook was invested in continuing to, to gather this binary gender information um, so that they could sell data about users to advertisers. And so Facebook users um, got together and created all kinds of um, resistance to this. Um, so one uh, way that this was resisted um, that Bivens talks about in her research is um, trans Facebook users created YouTube videos and online instructions for how to hack your profile um, in order to break the uh, binary data that Facebook um, gathered about you. So that's this kind of way of sharing information amongst community about how you can um, resist the terms of digital platforms, but also it's a way of extending care um, by providing support and providing instruction. And Bivens talks about this as an example of how um, users can resist and hack configurations of gender that platforms offer up. Users can sever and open up new possibilities for gendered life, right? And that's a radical proposition for everyone is to open up more possibilities for gendered life. Like who doesn't want that? That's a, that's a wonderful thing. <coughs> so this is an example of speaking back to platforms and databases and the terms that they set. And it's an example of critique that, that matters, that has an impact. So um, uh, I promise you that uh, SFU in the future will be more kind of mindful of these, um, these questions and more thoughtful about the needs of trans folks as they roll out these sort of technologies. And hopefully over time, large institutions will start to consider more the diverse needs of users from the very beginning. So this is the second uh, point I wanted to make, which is about um, censorship. So the second thing I want to argue that trans and queer people know about the internet that the rest of the world can learn from um, is why we should fight online censorship. So I'm going to give um, a couple examples first for context um, for the ways that uh, queer folks and trans folks experience censorship on online platforms. And these will probably be familiar to many folks um, here as well. And if you have a uh, observation or a kind of personal experience of platform censorship, um, I also welcome you and invite you to, to share it in the chat because I think it's useful to learn from each other about how often this kind of thing happens. So the two examples you see on the screen here are examples from Instagram, um, from ones from 2019 and ones from 2018. These are both examples of quite innocuous posts uh, that were flagged and removed for um, uh, violating the community standards of the platform. So the one on the left is from an organization called Dirty Looks, which is uh, a film screening series 
um, based in Los Angeles, New York and Los Angeles, that um, screens historical uh, LGBTQ plus uh, film and video. So this was to promote an event. Um, they put up this uh, photo of these three kind of like white looking hippie dudes from um, the 70s and they put flowers um, over their genitals and Facebook removed um, the photo. And so then they reposted it with larger flowers and it was allowed to stay up. So there's this kind of always question of like um, pushing at that margin or trying to push at that edge of what you can show on a platform or what you can get away with. And so queer folks think experimenting with pushing at that edge um, can, can reveal to us where it is that platforms draw the line so that we can start to map where that line drawing happens. Because a lot of the time these rules and standards and community guidelines are actually quite opaque to users. The image on the right is from uh, the lesbian uh, and non-binary poet Eileen Miles. And um, uh, Miles posted this on their Instagram account. It's a photograph of a poem by Zoe Leonard, um, who's a well-known American um, queer uh, visual artist. This is a poem that Leonard wrote in the early 1990s called I Want a Dyke for President. And uh, around the time of Donald Trump's um, election, this uh, poem was put up like giant like this on the High Line in New York City and uh, Miles had photographed it and many other people had photographed it and Instagram was taking the poem down. So you see Miles writes here, um, do we even have to defend this as art or Zoe's career? What are the words you object to? Dyke, want, president. So here we see queer materials, even when they're not visual, right? Even when it's on an actual picture are being censored and removed by platforms. So again, it's like testing and trying to understand where that line is and understand how these rules and standards are being applied often arbitrarily. So in both these examples, queer folks are targeted uh, by sometimes human content moderators and sometimes um, uh, algorithmic content moderation, so automated forms of content moderation. And queer folks are targeted in these cases because of the ways that representing and discussing sexuality is fundamental to how we live and communicate with each other. And it can be threatening, right, when it is uh, pushing at the boundaries of what um, counts as uh, decent or as a community value. Um, another concept that will be familiar to many folks uh, that I wanted to bring into the discussion tonight is uh, shadow banning. <clears throat> so shadow banning is a term that describes when a user's posts are deprioritized by a taste algorithm and hidden from other users without transparency or oversight. So someone who's been shadow banned often doesn't know for sure that they've been shadow banned, but they have reason to suspect that they have been shadow banned. And this is a concept that my students always really uh, want to talk about because it's something that um, seems to affect many communities, um, especially queer and trans BIPOC users. So I posted a citation at the bottom to a really great article about the issue of shadow banning from a popular publication called um, Bustle that I recommend uh, if you want to learn more about this. And one of the folks who's profiled in that article is uh, Radam Ridwan, who uh, says that after they began openly expressing themselves as queer and non-binary on Instagram around February 2019, they were, quote, increasingly shadow banned. Um, and this is the, the journalist who wrote the article speaking. They tell me, I noticed that engagement on my photos had decreased significantly despite organically gaining a larger following. They found their handle couldn't be found when typed into the search bar. The shadow ban for me meant that hashtags on my posts would not work and effectively excluded my pictures from appearing on the explore page. And the explore page is when you push that like button on Instagram where it just shows you a bunch of stuff that you might like. So for some reason, mine always shows me like smoothies and dogs, which I, I do like both those things, but not that much. Uh, and you probably all have like your own uh, version of that. So shadow banning matters because shadow banning seeds control of our public discourse to invisible forces that we can't see, 
that we can't understand. It's really hard to hold them accountable. And there's no space for debate or to mutually agree upon practices of what we want to see on our platforms. And in particular, what queer and trans folks want to see on their explore page, right? Which might be Ridwan's work. And shadow banning matters because it is coming for everyone, right? So these kinds of practices of censorship, of uh, marginalization are often tested out at first on minoritized folks, and then they creep their way into the online experiences of everyone else. And so we need to really be listening at this moment to the ways that trans and queer folks are thinking about and experiencing um, shadow banning. Uh, this is another example of um, uh, censorship in a trans context that um, I think is really smart. Um, so I'm not going to show a clip from this uh, video or video, but um, I've posted information on how you can find it on your own, and I really recommend it. I, I often teach with this video; it's six and a half minutes long. It's a National Film Board short called Do I Have Boobs Now? And it's available free um, for streaming on the NFB website. It's from 2017. And it tells the story of a Victoria-based trans activist named Courtney Damone. And she launched an online um, viral campaign called Do I Have Boobs Now? And in the campaign every day or every couple of days, she posted topless photos of herself during her um, transition when she started hormone replacement therapy. So over the course of that transition, um, she went from having a flat chest, which um, digital platforms interpreted as a male chest, which is a concept I'm you know, trying to problematize by doing this with my fingers, of course inadequate, but I hope that comes across. Over the course of hormone replacement therapy, um, she was interested in what is the moment at which the content moderation policies are going to start to understand my chest and my breasts as women's breasts and as women's nipples. So for Damone, she's a woman from the beginning of starting to post these photos, but for the platform, platforms like Instagram, like Facebook, there's a moment where, there, where a shift happens, right? And of course that's like absurd to mark a gender transition down to a particular um, day. Uh, but by surfacing this work and by using her body to do this activist work, Damone wanted to point out how absurd and arbitrary these standards are around gendered bodies and nudity. So most platforms um, uh, will allow um, like male nipples, photos of male nipples, but not photos of female nipples. And of course, there's many kinds of bodies and genders that um, push on the possibility of that binary in the first place and can kind of like break or um, pull at uh, content moderation policies. So in this film, Damone reflects on the ways that trans women's bodies in general are surveilled, policed, and hyper-scrutinized in all aspects of social life. So she talks, for example, a lot about what it's like to um, experience uh, like street culture in Victoria at nighttime, right? And feelings of not feeling safe um, as a trans woman walking alone at night in the video. And it's really important for her in the video to talk about how content moderation policies on social media platforms um, are nothing new for trans women. They simply extend these um, ongoing um, and uh, offline experiences of surveillance um, and harassment. And one of the things I like about this film is that we learn about content moderation from Damone's perspective. So this is a reminder, right, that content moderation affects different people um, differently. And we can draw together Redown Ridwan and Courtney Damone's um, stories uh, to think about how it's often femininity or feminist that's being policed or censored on online platforms. Uh, and trans misogyny, right, is often and, and misogyny more generally is often what is driving uh, content moderation and the ways that sexualized bodies or semi-nude bodies are regulated on online platforms. So Damone's campaign is a way of making um, these censorship policies like visible and also pointing out how absurd they are. So again, a, a moment where trans folks are speaking back to 
the internet as it is and imagining the internet that we want, right? It's absurd to kind of arbitrarily draw the line between what is a male and a female nipple and what does that term even mean? And why do we have or want content moderation policies that are grounded in binary models about gender? So this is the last point I'll make and then we'll have about 10 minutes for questions if there are any questions. And the last point or argument I wanted to make was uh, that trans and queer people show us how we can imagine digital utopias or how we can try and move towards the internet that we want. So I'm gonna show actually a couple examples of artists projects that I think do that really well. This is a relatively new project and if you're interested you can go to the site uh, queer.ai and you can sign up for their newsletter to get updates on the project as it unfolds. But these folks at Queer AI are trying to build a queer artificial intelligence. And what they're doing is they're building a chat bot. So a chat bot is like if you're on the website of, um, I don't know, like you're trying to buy something online and like a little thing pops up that's like, would you like help? And you're like, yes. And then often you're not actually chatting with a person, you're chatting with, with a bot. So artificial intelligence that's trained to handle um, common uh, problems that a consumer might have or questions that a consumer might have. And then if you confound the AI, the chat bot will pass you over to a real person who will then chat with you. So these are conversational artificial intelligence. They're trained uh, through um, different kinds of uh, language processing at, to um, have conversations with people that make it seem as if um, they are human. So these folks at Queer AI are trying to create a uh, queer chatbot that is trained on um, erotic literature, feminist and queer theory, and an ethics of embodiment. So the data that they're actually feeding to this AI in order to train it how to chat, how to have conversations, is the text of erotica and feminist and queer theory. So it's an experiment, right? Like what kind of conversations could artificial intelligence have if it was trained on that content? What would that look like? And how would it push us to think differently about um, AI? This isn't a chatbot that's going to be useful, right? It's one that might show us other ways of being with artificial intelligence. And AI, of course, governs more and more of our experiences uh, with technology, and we need models for thinking of it in more creative ways. So for me in general, it's artworks um, that make me excited about different approaches, queer and trans approaches to technologies. Uh, so this is another example, uh, kind of getting on in age at this point. This project's from 2012 to 2014 by an artist named Zach Blass, whose work I really admire. The project is called uh, Fag Face Mask. So Blast created this project in response to an academic study that came out that claimed um, that uh, the concept of gay face was a real thing. So you could tell uh, whether somebody was gay or not by looking at a picture of their face and it um, <clears throat> used machine learning to prove this. And the, the study was widely criticized for being kind of bad science, but it, it got a lot of media attention and Blast wanted to respond to it. So what Blast did was he created this mask that you see on the left of the slide, which he called the fag face mask. And it's a mask, I believe it's made of, of something like silicone, but it amalgamates the faces of hundreds of gay men who volunteered for the project. And he amalgamated all of their faces and um, created this mask that can't be read by facial recognition technologies. So facial recognition technologies are like when you, um, if you have a phone that unlocks by looking at your face, for example, that's a facial recognition technology. Um, so this mask is, brings together the kind of like power of this gay face myth to resist everyday digital surveillance, right? To make the gay face unreadable if you're wearing this mask. And so Blast is turning the homophobic logic of the gay face on its head to create a device that's resistant to surveillance. Uh, this is another person whose work I really admire. This is Lil Miss Hot Mess, who is a drag queen and also a media scholar and um, an activist. And um, you can, this article is great, but you can also find more of Little Miss Hot Mess's um, work online if you Google her. 
And um, uh, she was one of the folks responsible for changing Facebook's real names policy, which is a policy that used to exist on Facebook where your name had to be like your, your real name that you couldn't use um, other names of, of your choosing names like, for example, Little Miss Hot Mess, uh, which was of course a, a transphobic policy. And so Little Miss Hot Mess um, found in her research that drag queens uh, who are in drag often confounded facial recognition algorithms, they often broke them. So, you know, on platforms like Facebook or on an iPhone, for example, it'll sometimes, if you put a new photo on, it'll say, is this a photo of so-and-so? And it'll suggest tags for the images. Well, drag queens in drag would kind of break those suggestions and turn up um, suggestions for tags that were absurd or inaccurate. Couldn't tell a lot of drag queens apart, for example. And so Little Miss Hotness uses this as a moment to depart from. And she argues that regular folks um, should use drag queen strategies to mess with Facebook and to better protect their privacy. So she argues that you can better protect your privacy on Facebook by using a chosen name, the way that drag queens do. You can like things ironically on Facebook, things that you don't actually like. Uh, to kind of mess up the algorithm and how it understands you. And she draws on this from the propensity of drag queens to like things ironically. The third suggestion she makes is that you can mistag photos to confuse the facial recogni recognition algorithm. So drag queens tagging themselves both in and out of drag um, often do this on Facebook. So I really recommend her work as, as an example of a kind of creative approach to imagining other internets. This is my last slide. I wanted to leave us with this image. It's uh, an artwork by a uh, liberal Jane, who's an artist who shares um, their work on Instagram. Uh, so it's, uh, I'll describe the image. It's a, a non-binary looking white um, person who's reclined um, behind a desktop um, computer from the uh, early 1990s. And the person is lying in this kind of high tech but vintage looking field of space with binary code in the background and the caption says save the binary for the computer. So binary code right is of course like a really simple coding language uh, where um, information is written in just zeros and ones so you can only write either a zero or a one and it's also the way that we talk about um, damaging and violent gendered systems that only understand people as being male or female. And so I like this image because it's it's fun and it's playful uh, and it's kind of pushing on this incompatibility um, between binary computers and um, non-binary people and queer and trans life worlds. So what does this incompatibility potentially open up in our thinking and in how we can imagine what we want uh, from digital technologies and the internet? That's the question I'm going to um, leave us with. Thank you all for coming. It was a pleasure. Uh, and thank you for the questions and for your for sharing your stories and your attention. It was really nice to be here with you all. Thank you, Kate, for this great presentation. We really enjoyed it and it seems like everybody else did too. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us this evening. And hopefully uh, everyone can uh, look at the links that were sent in the chat and uh, get more out of it. Thank, thank you. you for sharing your expertise. Thank you for a very informative presentation. Thank you everyone for joining us. I wish you all have a lovely evening. Okay, take care everybody. <laughs>